being a guy, like I, I was hoping for a boy. Then at our 20 week checkup is, and that's when their your, your normal doctor is supposed to tell you. Right. She goes, yep, you're having a girl. I don't know what it's like to have a boy, but I'm so glad I had a girl. Every, everything that I wanted to do, you know, I, I can, there's no reason I can't do it with her. You know, I got her on the skateboard. She skates. She likes the rough house. She likes to go in the ocean, you know, but I just wasn't thinking about that. I want to have built of old wood. You could paint it any color you like, just so long as I can live with you. Paint it any color you like, just so long as I can live with you. I want a house. It started with a question about clothing, and it beautifully grew into a conversation about gender. A conversation that touches on all aspects of gender, especially how a sometimes extremely rigid gender binary can make for a confusing and difficult life. This binary that is so ingrained in our culture that it is seen in the ways we walk, talk, dress, and essentially live our lives. It's not about being an expert though, it's about being human. It's a dialogue about the things that can be uncomfortable for some and completely overlooked by others. The role that gender plays throughout many of the various stages of our lives, its generations, its conversations, but mostly it's taking the time to listen. We started this journey talking with UC Berkeley doctoral student, Anna Torres. One thing that I discussed with my students is thinking about what are the origins of a binary gender system because we know that's not present in every culture. Um, there are, you know, a multitude of examples of gender multiplicity and vocabularies of gender multiplicity outside of the proliferation that we have today in English. The ancients were gender theorists no less than Judith Butler, you know? Mm -hmm and really thinking of how the earliest texts that we have, like Gilgamesh, is this homoerotic love story, you know, of these two characters, Gilgamesh and Enkidu, like from our very earliest writing, we have a multiplicity of genders represented, both in Western and non-Western. It seems that gender has been a topic of interest for quite some time. It runs deep in our history. But let's take a second look and simplify Gender is something that's taught to us. It's not something that we're born with. Gender is a social construct, meaning it's a perception of an individual or a group or an idea that's constructed through the cultural and social practice that we get as we grow. And this makes it really difficult for some people to discuss how they are the way they are. It's really hard to get that kind of self-awareness. So hold up, we're throwing around a lot of words here and not that many definitions of those words. So we should probably start the conversation about gender with the definition of gender. So the classic dictionary definition of sex and gender is basically the same. Depending on where you look up the definition, sex and gender could be the same thing. The state of being male or female. And without context, I suppose that could be true. Sex and gender could be the same. But over time, we've seen that the sex declared the moment you are born doesn't match all the time with the gender that that person identifies with. Gender has come to mean one's most innermost concept of self as male, female, both, or neither, and how individuals perceive themselves and what they call themselves. One's gender identity can be the same or different as the sex assigned at birth. That's right, the same or different. So look at it as a spectrum. In the binary world, there would only be male, 
or female. But if you look outside the binary, there are so many more things going on. Facebook recently announced it would offer its users 56 different gender options. Agender, bigender, gender neutral, pangender, just to name a few, on top of the fact that you're male, female, masculine, feminine, you know, it changes. Gender is very complex and it's extremely valuable because it's part of who you are. When people feel their outside expression fits their inside identity, they become way more powerful, way more comfortable, and ultimately they become happier. We thought a good place to start exploring this idea of sex and gender not always being the same is with children. I mean, thinking about it, sometimes we have a tendency to start gender socializing our kids before they're even out of the womb. And what is it about knowing a baby's sex that helps us imagine and plan their future? Um, a four and five year old's brain, who I teach, um, their entire life is trying to figure out, like, what is this world so, I, so that I can navigate myself. Like, they're just like, I just need to know what's up so I can figure things out. And so their brains are set up to categorize because they're just trying to sort themselves out. Um, so the first thing they say, are you a boy or a girl, right? And like, that's my chance. I can do so much with that moment. The way that we describe boys and little girls is completely different. When my brother shows up, my mom has a daycare. When my brother shows up to the daycare, he high fives the little boys and hugs the little girls. Right there is like, a, it's a, just an example of how genderized we have become. And it, little things like that aren't necessarily problematic but they become problematic when somebody doesn't fit in those boxes. I try to stay away from it, but um, I notice that if I tell a five-year-old boy, you're a really good person, he's like, cool, okay. And then if I tell him, I'm like, you're such a brave knight, he's like, yeah, I am brave, you know? Um, so we fall into these pitfalls because we're lazy. People tell yeah. me he's too beautiful to be a boy all the time. I think when people make those comments, I always wonder, like, what is that saying about themselves? Because I get as Clark has had a haircut now, but his hair was a little longer at one point, and people always have said, like, oh, she. And it's kind of interesting how, like, the hair is, like, a big, like, flag for people. It just they use the language is completely different when you're talking about female and males and that happens before you're born and that's 100 percent true you go you go and bite the blue you go and bite the soccer balls when you don't you have no idea what this person is going to be like i guess we'll start with did you guys find out you're having a boy we did okay. we found out um at the um big anatomy scan at about 20 weeks um i was very much looking forward to finding out um, I think for me, I wanted to find out because it just seemed like it made it more real and we could pick a name. But I have a mutual friend that's daughter is 100% convinced that she's a little boy. She walks, talks, dresses, acts like a little boy and that's just who she is. Hmm. And then I have, you know, a friend with a son who's kind of a wuss and I think it bums him out a little bit. Everyone's trying to do like the right thing and like be, I, I mean, I think that in parenting in general, like very few people I think in the world are setting out to have kids to like ruin them or like be like evil. Like, I mean, everything is about that. It's just, it's not always the right way. And you don't always know what your kid is gonna need from you. And maybe you think you're doing the right thing and then it turns out it's not the right thing and yeah. And it's funny about how adamant they are because they're really tr like, they're sincerely asking me. They're not asking me in like the way you get interviewed for a job. They're like, no, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out like, are you a circle or a square? Cause I don't know it. <laughs> I'm not like trying to be PC right now. Yeah. So like, I'll be like, oh, I'm kind of both. And they're like, but I have a vagina. So what? Yeah. And I'm like, wait, yeah, me too. <laughs> Actually, what's so interesting is I will get a plethora of pronoun 
combinations from children, like in the same day, which is sort of like delightful for me. Where they're like, she said, he said, anyways, they said, and I'm like, you don't even know what's happening and I love it. And so they'll say, he said, in reference when they're talking to their parents, like after school. And then the parents get really nervous because they don't want, they're trying to show their kid that um, there's different ways of being a woman. And I think they're like really nervous about like the gay agenda. Like they don't want to like offend me. So they're like, she's a woman, Charlie. Oh my God. Of course you are. You're so lovely. Pretty face. <laughs> and then I'm like, wow. So I think it's in those moments where that's what socialization is. It's not explicit at all. But the way that their parents overreact like that, then they get this message of like, I better figure out who's who real quick because it is not okay. I don't want to say, I mean, I've never in my life thought about, oh, I was born in the wrong gender. I don't think that's the case, but I have felt that I've been, everything that I do and everything that I felt has been, you know, more male driven. Um, and perhaps me wanting a boy is something, you know, goes back to my childhood of like, you know, what if I would have been a boy? Like, what, what then? And so... There's like things that I do want to teach. I mean, I could teach a, a girl as just like I can teach a boy, but I don't know. I want to like take him out flying and I don't know, like different things that it's not necessarily, you know, driven by gender, but more so by, you know, what I, what I thought I saw in me when I was growing up. Growing up is hard enough. So if your gender, or your sexual orientation doesn't match the norm, high school, and nowadays even middle school, can be very difficult. Of all places, Carlsbad, a fairly conservative Southern California beach town, is home to one of the largest GSA high school groups in the country. The work that is being done at this school by advisors is helping redefine how we talk, teach, and learn about gender. Carlsbad High School has culturally changed over this decade um, in ways that simply wouldn't have happened without the work of these students in the JSA club. Students come to Carlsbad High School as well as every other school and they are identifying as LB LGBT and they don't know anyone else and they think there's something wrong with them and they become very isolated they don't have friends, they don't see anyone like themselves, and if they do have friends, they're secret about themselves. They're, they're lying to others about who they are. And so when you have a GSA club, and especially the larger it grows, they're not isolated anymore. Out of a percentage of people, not a lot of people think about their gender as a different sort of thing. But in our gender committee, we're all on a different spectrum. We have people that are trans, gender neutral, gender fluid, gender not gendered, you know. We have people that, we have a few cis people, yeah, that are like completely fine, but they come in because they realize the situation. And so you get all different aspects of that. I feel like as humans, we have a tendency to need to label things. From the very beginning, we've always wanted to be like, oh, this is a spoon, this is a fork, and this is how you use it. And I feel like labels aren't necessarily a bad thing, as long as you're the one choosing your labels. Because like explaining to my mother that I am male, and then there's like gender, sex, and sexuality. I am male, yeah, I have like female anatomy, but that doesn't mean I'm not male. Like gender is in your head, and gender is also a very big spectrum. It's not black and white. It's very gradient. I'm a pretty feminine person. I wear a lot of makeup. And uh, I tend to like act feminine for what is considered feminine, but I really don't feel like a girl at all most of the time. If I want to be male, I can be male, and, and no one can really stop me. And like, I don't have to look a certain way. I don't have to wear certain clothes. I can wear whatever I want. I can wear dresses if I look good. I can do anything that I want, as, and I'm the only one that has jurisdiction over what I identify as. And if I tell people that I'm male, they'll have to respect that, and they're not gonna change who I am, and they're not gonna be able to say, well, you wear dresses, you can't be. But I am, so here I am. There's cultural change going on 
in our country, and we do have the Bruce Jenners and marriage equality now um, through the Supreme Court, a lot of people in the general community think, oh, it's so much better. Things are good now. Well, yes, in one way to measure things, they are so much better. But for the lives of individual children across this country, no, they're not better. Not for most of them. I've had a lot of things happen in my life, but I've had you know, a lot of trauma, things like that, sometimes involving my gender, sometimes not. Um, but I've just dealt with all these sorts of feelings that were only amplified by feeling like I didn't belong. There needs to be some real learning about in the, in the public, yeah, and certainly schools, about the complexity of gender, the non-binary aspect of gender. When we did a survey last year, 20% of my GSA club members have attempted suicide. That's horrifying. And these are students in our club who are getting some support, but who have already attempted. Now, the thoughts about suicide are just astronomical. So this is across the nation, this is happening. And we know the statistics, the numbers of transgender people who ultimately um, take their lives. So this is critical work that has to be done. I think that like there should be a GSA in every school, to be honest. Like, I honestly have no idea where I would be right now without, without like the support group that GSA and gender committee offers. Like, like I'm, I don't even think I would be here right now, to be honest. It's incredibly rewarding, but it's also really, um, it, it can be a very emotionally draining. I mean, I'm, I come to school worried that I'm going to lose a kid that day because I know it's a possibility every single day and I've had to be there with those attempts, and fortunately, they didn't succeed. It would be a very, very different place today at this school had there never been a GSA club. Later in my 20s, I started to realize oh, some people take pleasure in how they feel in their bodies, in their casing. Like uh, cis women who want to perform femininity, when they put on lipstick or jewelry, like it's like, it's sexy to them, it's pleasurable, it's fun, it feels good. I never had that for like my entire life basically. Never felt what it was like to take pleasure in it. And then I realized gender for me is just really taking pleasure in how you feel inside your body. So then when I cut my hair, I started wearing um, men's clothing. I started to feel that feeling of like, this is a match of how I feel. Like I don't really like get dressed and say like, this is my gender, go, you know? <laughs> no, you put on what, uh, you're like, these jeans look real nice on me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. At a certain point, I probably could have transitioned because I felt like I should have been in a different body. But I'm actually so glad that I didn't because it was really just going deeper into like this person that I, that I am and that I was and that I have always been and that like I'm it, like finally content with like who I ended up being. I guess you could say categorically speaking, boys love sports and they love, you know, 
being on teams. And then definitely I played baseball and all that stuff, but did I truly enjoy it? No. Um, so I think, you know, you know, playing baseball, all that stuff, that was kind of said that that's what guys should do. I didn't necessarily like doing it, but I also felt like, well, I don't have too much to prove to anyone else as long as I'm doing what I like to do. Um, maybe in the early ages, you know, you kind of conform. That's what probably why I went out for baseball and play baseball and all that stuff. But it, you know, gradually kind of changed to other things. You know, I remember in middle school, when, I don't remember like where, but I remember someone being like, you saying, telling me that I talked like a girl. Like, why do you talk like a girl? And I remember being so like mad about them saying that. And I was like, but how could I talk like a girl when I'm a boy and I'm talking? I think I said that to my friend, like, in a rage. Um, so, th you know, things like that. Like, that wouldn't happen if someone was like, pe all people sound different. All people look different. All people dress different. Like, it's not, there's no, like, pre-written way that you're supposed to do it. In um, some Scandinavian languages, there is no gender pronoun at all. There's just the word han, mm -hmm. and that means person, and that is that. There isn't a he, she, z, they, v, etc. Um, so we can see when we shift from thinking in this moment of time being binary, shifting towards the long view of history and also towards the global view of um, how gender the role, how gender roles vary. I think that adults are still carrying around the thing that I was carrying around when I was 10, which is that if you misgender someone, you're calling them unattractive or less than. Because like, okay, if they call me sir and I'm not a sir, and then what I think what they're feeling is is that they just called me a mannish woman. They're like, you're mannish and beat. <laughs> and then they're like, that's not true. Oh my God, you're fine. They're trying to like, you know, gloss that over and mend that when a, like a different gender coming out has nothing to do with um, worth or attractiveness for me. So, they're, so I think people are conditioned that gender matching equals attractiveness. They don't, they don't want to hurt your feelings. It's strange. It's strange what your hair represents mm -hmm. with your gender. I, it's really weird, but it's... It's usually the first thing that that people notice. What do they say when you're when you're making a dramatic life change, like you cut your hair first or you dye your hair? Mm -hmm. It's like the first thing when you want to pivot in your life. Well, people are not educated about these concepts, so they're afraid of this kind of thing. Um, it's the same kind of people that think that you know, gay marriage or these concepts that they're unfamiliar with are going to like corrupt the youth just because it's gonna it will shake up these preconceived ideas that are embedded in you know our society so it's the same thing so people hear that companies are going to start gender neutralizing their stores or toys or campaigns or whatever it may be and they think that that's not what I've seen my whole life. That's going to mess up. My children aren't going to think the exact same things as me. They're not going to feel as, you know, they're not going to fit as neatly into this gender box as I have. So, like, they, they'll be in trouble or they'll be bullied or they'll be, you know, I won't understand them. Parents want you to be a certain way when you're growing up out of fear that if you are different that you'll get ridiculed, you'll get hurt, or something will happen to you. And I think I can understand that, like you said, it comes from a place of love, but at the same time, it's like, you know, are you allowing the kid to actually become who they should be or who they want to be? This rigid gender socialization, it, it leads to inevitable unhappiness and pain for kids that don't fit into the categories, you know? As conversations like this happen, it gets people thinking about about how to step outside of the binary, how to handle that transition or evolution, or even have a conversation about it because 
the labels mm -hmm. are easy. Everyday life is hard. It's just yeah, I think it's the more information you receive and the more and the more you question yourself, uh, you know, the more you learn about yourself as you learn about other things in life. Yeah. How could you understand or how could you even fathom somebody that doesn't fit in that box without understanding the difference between gender and sex? And it's, it's, compli it's complicated in a lot of ways but it's not complicated in a lot of ways as well. And I think if you could separate the two, you could understand or try to understand and respect these people that maybe you don't see, you don't see how that could happen. You don't see how somebody feels like they don't belong in their own body. But I think the first step is to understand, yeah, the difference between gender and sex, which your gender identity does not have to match your, the, the, genitalia that you're born with. There we are, trying to figure out where to go from here. It feels like all of this information just created more questions. Oh man, did I just make that? Sorry. But maybe that's okay. Maybe sometimes the questions can tell us more than the answers. Maybe hoping we can do better is all we really need. And I don't know what the solution is, you know? I don't know if it's like a difference in how we teach kids what is important and like what what qualities are worth mentioning? You know, when we're going, when we're sitting in a circle in preschool, and it's like, let's talk about ourselves. Maybe it's like figuring out how to foster an environment of like saying more unique things and like less, I don't know, like more less obvious traits or something. I think it starts with you know the education of kids. A young age, just giving them a, a platform to be like, you know, open minded, a little bit more open to what's out there. What are the material effects mm -hmm. of moving beyond a binary and who profits? You know, um, these are big historical questions yeah. to think about. I think um, my hope, I, I hope that I evolve in my gender identity enough to love people without having to infuse it with so much of the binary, that would be really good. So we end in the same place we started, at my barber shop. Historically, a place that most refer to as a men's sanctuary. Your barber, like your bartender, you speak to with no filter. And as a woman, I want to be a part of that. I respect that culture. I go there because I like how I feel about myself when I leave. Men's things, women's things. I just don't think it has to apply to everything in our culture. Experiences, feelings, haircuts, clothing. They have no gender. Let's just let people live. Let's allow people to be their true selves. And thank God I found a barber who welcomes me with open arms. It feels good breaking that gender binary. So go on and keep talking about the things that make us uncomfortable. It can only lead to progression. It can only begin to heal our society.
to my left, I've got my patience. To my right, my hesitations.